15. Um, when we moved into our house, uh, which will be almost 12 months ago now, uh, here in Oldfield Drive, um, uh, it was lovely because the, the lady, the old lady that had the house, obviously looked after the garden very well. So we decided that we, would, um, we wouldn't start um, doing stuff in the garden. We'd just wait and see what grew during the 12 months. Um, you know, what, what was already there. Uh, some of the stuff we couldn't see, some of the stuff we could. And in the back garden, there was um, a really impressive looking plant. Um, and as soon as we moved in, I, I remember saying to my wife, well, I think that's going to be lovely. Um, it just looked like it got loads of potential. Um, and so we, we watched and we waited through spring and into early summer and uh, lo and behold the leaves came and it began to be quite full with leaves, this plant uh, and our hopes grew oh, it's going to be fantastic, that's going to be wonderful um, and summer came and um, we watered it and uh, the, the leaves grew and it, it, it looked even more as though it had great potential and loads of leaves on it I thought Soon enough, we're going to see some flowers here. Uh, we went through the summer, and we got it on to uh, sort of late autumn, and still nothing. And then suddenly, this tiny little white flower budded at the end of one of the branches, full of leaves. Um, and that was it. That was it. It was, uh, it was about that long, a couple of centimetres. This little white flower among all of these, these leaves on this potential impressive looking plant. Um, I have to tell you, it was a huge disappointment. Uh, lots of other stuff were great, but this one was a huge disappointment. And it was just a few weeks ago that I had the spade to it. Uh, got the fork out, um, and with much exertion and much satisfaction at the end of it, I managed to get right underneath the roots of it and yanked it out um, and replaced it with something that I hope will um, be, be, be much better. Um, it was a great disappointment. <laughs> Thanks for that, Lisa. You know, there's all sorts of ways you could take that illustration, of course. But I want to tell you now, it was an absolute disappointment. And there was no way I was going to give it another 12 months. <laughs> Not that disappointment. But you're absolutely right. There's all sorts of ways you could take that. Um, I've introduced what I wanted to say this morning to just to remind you that the Bible uses the language of um, fruitfulness. Um, uh, I've used a picture of a flower there, but the, the, the language of fruitfulness for growing in character. Uh, when anyone becomes a Christian and is born again by the Spirit, uh, with it comes God's promise to change a person in ways which will be visible. It's what, John, it's what Jesus meant when he first met Peter. Do you remember at the beginning of John's Gospel? And he said to Peter, you are Simon, uh, son, of, you are Simon son of John. Um, you will be called Peter, um, which means rocky. And at that particular uh, moment, uh, that's, uh, Peter was anything but rocky. And Jesus made that promise to him. You are Simon, son of John. You shall be the rocky. Um, and it's why a Christian can say this morning, I'm not what I will be, uh, but I'm not what I once was either. I'm a work in progress. I am a work in progress. Well, what do these verses here in this chapter, um, which are about fruitfulness, have to say to us about that change in character? Um, well, we're going to look at that. Uh, but, but first of all, just briefly, uh, something about the context. I want you to know that as Jesus says these words to us, it is effectively the day before he's going to the cross. Um, this is the Thursday before Good Friday. Uh, and the thousands of people that had um, been attracted to Jesus by this stage had been whittled down to just 11. So what Jesus is saying here are to his closest, dearest, beloved, disciples. And what he says to them, he says to all true believers, true Christians, so we get the privilege of listening in, as it were, to this very intimate conversation that Jesus is having um, with the 11 disciples. Um, he knows what's going to happen to him, and he knows the, the way in which their own world is going to feel as though it's been turned upside down 
with the events that are about to happen to him in the next 24, 48 hours. How all the doubts are going to pour into them. <laughs> you know, have, have we done the right thing by trusting in Jesus? And so he says these, uh, these words. Three things uh, that I think it, it tells us about changing in character in response to what Jesus is going to do at the cross. One of the things is being sure. The second, bearing fruit. And the third, remaining in love. I've just chosen those three simple headings as a way I hope for us to remember the important things in this chapter. Being sure, bearing fruit, and remaining in love. And they're connected like this. Because a Christian is intimately joined to Jesus, connected to Jesus as a branch to a vine, um, that's the idea of being sure. That's, that's the first point. Growing in Christian character, growing in fruitfulness, is not just possible, it's inevitable. That's the second point. Uh, and how does a Christian grow in fruitfulness? By abiding in his love. That's, that's, how, that's the third part. That's how those headings are connected. So let's have a look at the first one. Uh, being sure. Have I got, I've got them all down there together. There we go. Being sure. Jesus wants his disciples, he wants us to be sure. What does he want us to be sure of? Well, first of all, that Jesus is not the loser. And God says so. Have a look at that in verse 1. That's how he begins. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And whenever Jesus says, I am, he's using the words which say, yeah, this is how it is. This is how God, the great I am, speaks. This is, this is how it is, because I am the great I am. And so I'm telling you how it is. Um, and he says, I'm the true vine. And we might ask ourselves, well, what does he mean by that? Well, throughout John's Gospel, he's often used that expression, I am, uh, reminding us of his authority to speak, and he's used it in, in different ways. I am the, the good shepherd, for example. Do you remember that? Um, and when he's doing this, he's drawing on Old Testament ideas uh, to give us the meaning of what he's saying. When he said, I am the, the good shepherd, he was saying, I'm the one who would um, be what the, the religious teachers of the past were supposed to be, but never were. Uh, and so his implication, when he says, I'm the good shepherd, is listen to me. Um, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people in the past, were supposed to be those who would bring a blessing to the world. You know, um, like a plant, if you like, like a vine bearing bearing fruit in order to be a blessing to the world but they had failed and all they'd done was left this legacy of religious rules and, um, and what looked like just hypocrisy really and so into that Jesus says these words I am the true vine and the implication of what he's saying is that um, growing fruitfulness from now on is not about following religious rules it's not about doing the right thing. It's not about religion. It's about faith in what Jesus is about to do at the cross. Remember, this is the Thursday before the Friday. So he wants us to be sure that Jesus is not the loser. He's the winner, and he's saying that to his close band of disciples. Second thing we can be sure of that is that pruning is not a sign of losing. Pruning is not a sign of losing. Look at verse 2. He, the Father, cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And that's a picture of being finally cut off from God. And notice when he says he cuts off every branch in me, it suggests that he's referring here to religious looking people people who would be in church, if you like. In church, but not in Christ. It's possible to do that, isn't it? In church, but not in Christ. But look at how he treats Christians. Pruning is not a sign of losing. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, we, now we struggle with this, don't we? We don't want to be pruned. Pruning is... 
you know, pruning is difficult in life, isn't it? it, it it's uncomfortable. Another, another plant thing about our house. We've got this wisteria in the front of our house. Massive. It's been there for years and years. Um, and, uh, and it needs to be pruned. So I took some advice on that. And last autumn, I got out the front and pruned this wisteria. Um, I, I spent a whole afternoon doing it. Uh, uh, there's masses and masses of branches to, to cut back. Um, and you've got to make sure you do it very carefully. You've got to cut in just the right place. And, and as I was doing it, you know, using the secateurs, is that what you call them? Secateurs? Um, Matt is nodding. Um, you should know. Um, I don't know whether they were squealing, or it just felt like I was doing it some pain. You know, if you've ever done any chopping back, um, it feels like you're doing the plant some pain, actually. Uh, you know, I felt guilty, almost, as I was pruning this plant back. Um, but of course, unless I prune it back, it's not going to bear flowers. It's not going to bear the fruit in the next season. It had to be done. Um, yeah, that's what it's there for. Otherwise, you might as well get rid of it. And vines are there for what? They, they exist to bear fruit. They don't bear fruit might as well get rid of them. And the Father wants us to be fruitful. And so he talks here about pruning. And if he brings painful, difficult things into a Christian's life, without having time to spend a lot of time on this this morning, remember, just remember what it says here. It's at the hand of an infinitely loving, infinitely precise, eternally purposeful gardener. And pruning is not a sign of losing. These verses say pruning is purposeful. And of course we, we could spend a lot of time on that but we, we need to move on because we're going to look at the whole of this section this morning. But that's important and you can imagine as Jesus says that to the disciples the day before he's going to the cross and all that he knows is going to come to them. He wants to remind them that pruning is not a sign of losing. What can we be sure of number three? That the word that Jesus spoke in the disciples and speaks in true Christians means that they cannot finally be lost. Cannot finally be lost. Verse 3. What he says in verse 3, you are already clean, he says. He says you are already clean. And the word there is the same as, as the word prune that he's used in the previous verse. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. You're already pruned he says, because of the word that I've spoken to you. So Jesus says to the eleven, receiving and believing in his word, his message, as they've done, means that they have already received eternal life. And they will not be condemned. He says, they've crossed over from death to life. You've already been cleaned, he says. No matter what's ahead, and it's a wonderful reminder of the promises that we've already had in John's Gospel of that once, once for all time crossover that happens when a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and puts their trust in him. Whoever comes to me, Jesus said, will, I will never cast out. Never cast out. Or, or, or another one elsewhere. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So important that we remember that. Jesus' brother James calls it, uh, I love the way he calls the word of God that brings life, he calls it the implanted word. The word of life that's been, as it were, implanted. And it can't, it can't be reversed. It's that implanted word. And in 1 Peter, true Christians are those who have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. It talks about the power of the word to, to change people from one status to another, complete transformation, a crossing over. So have you been born again this morning? Have you believed 
the message of Jesus. That your sin and my sin separates us from God. And that on the cross, Jesus made, <coughs> made it possible for that to be dealt with. He was the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And on the cross, he was bearing the punishment that you and I deserve so that we could be forgiven to the glory of God the Father. Have you believed in that living and abiding truth? If you have, it says here, another thing you could be sure of is that you cannot finally be lost. Whatever these verses talk about fruitfulness, you cannot finally be lost. And that's an important context for what Jesus is going on, going on to say. And it means that the kind of character change that, that we've been talking about where the Bible talks about character change, it's not superficial. It's about a deep change that happens from within. As he changes us, he puts his spirit in us and changes us and makes us cross over, as it were, eternally from spiritual death to life. It's not, it's not a superficial change in character that Jesus is talking about here. And he wants the believers to be sure. He wants them to be sure Now, being sure of this, Jesus says that fruitfulness is not merely possible, it's inevitable. Verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now just think for a moment how how vitally connected the branches are to to a vine. Um, where, Where does one end and the other begin? They are completely and utterly connected, aren't they? The branch and the vine. And that's an image of the Christian's relationship with Jesus. That that vital connectedness. Sort of folded into one another in that way. That's that's the picture of a Christian's relationship with Jesus. And with Jesus' life pulsating through the believer, the the sap of the Lord Jesus, as it were, feeding and flowing through, then fruit... And much fruit is inevitable, verse 6. But it says, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Apart from me, you can do nothing. One more plant story. Can I give you one more? We've got a little lemon tree that somebody uh, bought us when we moved into the house, one of these miniature ones that's supposed to bear lemons. It's supposed to bear lemons. You can see where this is going, can't you? <laughs> we put it in the porch. We thought the sunshine would, you know, in the porch and the warmth would be really good for it. Um, and I know it's a lemon tree because it has a label that says, this is a lemon tree. Okay? Uh, with nice big pictures of juicy lemons. But if it didn't have a label, I wouldn't have a clue that it was a lemon tree. Because... It's just got no lemons on it. In fact, um, in fact, we, we, we took it up to Dobby's uh, a few months ago and, and said, can, can, can you tell us what we need to do? This is supposed to be a lemon tree. It's got no lemons on it. Um, and uh, see me after if you want to hear what they said. Um, but the point is, it was supposed to be a lemon tree. It got no fruit on it at all. Um, and Jesus says here that fruitfulness isn't merely possible. It's inevitable, actually for those who are connected in the way that Jesus says a Christian will be connected to Jesus. So what fruit should we expect? What fruit should we expect in a Christian? Well, four things these verses tell us uh, about that fruit. Um, What would it it mean to be fruitful? Well, first of all, putting Jesus' words into practice. Verse 10. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. So fruitfulness will include putting Jesus' words into practice. Secondly, it will include experiencing Jesus' joy. Verse 11, I told you this so that your joy may be complete. So fruitfulness will involve that. sense of Jesus' joy in, in, in trial and suffering, even. Thirdly, it will include love for other Christians. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other. That's what fruitfulness looks like. Love for one another here. 
Fourthly, it will include witness to the world. Look at verse 16. It says, go and bear fruit. Go and bear fruit. And the witnessing word there is go. You know, appetite to be involved in witness to the world. You might not be the person that's um, a preaching, for example, but you will want, you'll have an appetite to see this message going out and be involved in the message, the good news going out to the world. That's what bearing fruit is in these, in these verses. And it, and it isn't optional. There's, there's no room in Jesus' picture language here, is there, for, for us to say, you know, I'm, I'm like a low fruit variety. You know, or I only uh, very, very occasionally uh, bear fruit. You know, we might, you might, might think, well, you know, all this fruit bearing stuff, I, I, I prefer to leave that to the super religious lot. I mean, there are a few people here, you know, I, I can think of them in my mind. Um, yeah, 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 they're, they're, they should be bearing fruit, but, but I'm a kind of a low, a low bearing fruit variety. Uh, you know, they're, they're the, the extreme end, and I, I'm just at the more moderate end. Well, there's no room for that in this picture that Jesus uses, is there? Um, you don't say to a branch, you're too into that vine, do you? That's something like that. That would be a crazy thing to say, isn't it? You know, you're, you're, to, you're just a bit too connected. You ought to be just a bit, you know, a bit, bit distanced, a bit, bit more moderately connected to the vine. You wouldn't say that, would you? Bearing fruit isn't just a nice idea. And, and we're reminded of that in verse 6. Look what it says. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the bonfire, and burned. But compare that with a fruitful branch, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. Jesus set them, set them up a contrast there. With the, with, the, with the second picture in verse 7 of a, of a life changing to take on the same desires as Jesus himself. Fruitfulness, growing fruitfulness which glorifies the Father, verse 8. And so a Christian will want to be asking this morning, how am I doing? How obvious is my fruit? But more important, I think, this morning is the question, what do you want? How fruitful do you want to be? Because this passage doesn't allow us to stop there. It moves us on. How fruitful do you want to be? What effect is Jesus' words having on you in this passage right now? Is it perhaps having no effect at all? That's possible. That's possible. Or have you heard him say, if you're a Christian... You remain in me. Be sure. You do remain in me. Now go ahead and remain in me. Do you hear him say that to you? Do you hear his call to your heart this morning? Do you say, I want to be more fruitful? Well, then listen to the third thing he says. And this is perhaps the most important thing. Remaining in love. Remaining in love in verses 9 to 17. And this is perhaps the most important thing because you don't bear fruit to remain in his love. The point about these verses is that you bear fruit by remaining in his love. That's the only answer. It's the only answer whether if we're, if we're a visitor here this morning and, uh, and if we're a Christian, it's exactly the same. You will only bear fruit that lasts by remaining in his love. Verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. And the point is, Jesus didn't obey his Father's commands to remain in his Father's love. His obedience was the fruit of his love. He only ever could obey his father. 
And that picture of fruit is helpful here, isn't it? Because fruits grow by drawing the life and the nutrients from the vine, don't they? They don't add anything in and of themselves. They grow as they draw from the vine. And in the same way, if we would be fruitful, that fruit must draw itself from the vine and not vice versa. Jesus' life flowed naturally out of his Father's love. And any failure that we have to be fruitful, to grow and to change as God intends, is ultimately our failure to live out of his love. Our failure to live out of his love. Remain in my love, he says. Four things about that love, four things to draw life from this morning. It's how we how we're going to finish off really. Just to point out in these verses, four things about that love that I want you to notice. First of all, it's infinite. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, so have I loved you. Was there ever a greater love than that between the Father and the Son? Infinite love. And Jesus says, that's how much I love you. We used to have a little book at home called uh, Guess How Much I Love You. A story about a little nut brown hair, a little hair. Um, and uh, he's always trying to tell his mum how much he loves her. And, and he's always wanted to tell her he loves her more than she loves him. I love you as high as a hop. I love you as high as the tree. I love you all the way to the moon and the stars. And his mum's always able to top it. At the end of the book she says, I love you all the way to the moon and stars and back and back. And how does Jesus say how much he loves us? What does he use? What's his measure? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. That's the deep, that's the deep well of his love that he would have, to have us draw from in order to be fruitful. It's infinite. Number two, it's sacrificial. Just briefly. Greater love has no man than this, verse 13, that he lays down his life for his friends. It's what we're going to be thinking of in a moment as we share communion together. His infinite love is a proven love at the cross. His blood poured out for us. His body broken for us. The Son of God. It's infinite. It's sacrificial. It's relational. Verse 15, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I've made known to you. His love for you means that you have all the truth that there is. The last word. Your friends don't keep anything from one another, do they? Friends share everything. And Jesus says, I call you friends. I call you friends. And it's eternal, verse 16. You didn't choose me, Jesus says. Listen to this. You didn't choose me, I chose you and appointed you. That's a wonderful thing to remember when we we want to think about that deep well of the Father's love. Love before the dawn of time was sometimes seen, don't we? Chosen by my maker, hidden in my saviour. And if we would be fruitful, we must, we need to live out of that love. Love which is infinite, love which is sacrificial, love which is relational, love which is eternal. And you can see how it works. When Jesus gives the command in verse 12, you love one another as I have loved you, I have to say, I can't do that. I can't try to do that. I can't squeeze that kind of fruitfulness out of myself with effort. But if I focus on his love, if I draw from his love, then it becomes possible. I'm impatient. Within the church family, I, I become impatient. I want people to change. I want people to respond to the Lord Jesus. I find it hard to forgive when I've been wronged. I insist that my way is best. That, you know, I don't want to listen to other people's ideas. I, I, I become insistent on my ways. But look what happens as I remain in his love, as I draw from that. If I'm impatient with people and I want them to change, I remember that Jesus chose me and I can bear patiently with people who aren't yet Christians, believers. When I'm struggling with unforgiveness, then the cross reminds me that the greatest debt has been 
forgiven. And that becomes the strength to forgive the, the lesser offence, doesn't it? When I think my way is always right, I remember that here are Jesus' friends, united in the same spirit. How can I be rude, you know, impose my own ideas and thoughts on people in that way? Because a Christian is intimately connected to Jesus, and that's the beautiful picture of the vine and the branches that we have here, isn't it? Growing in Christian character, growing in fruitfulness, is not just possible, it's inevitable. And how do we do it? By abiding in his love. By abiding in his love. There's no room for...